can't mention all of them, but Merrill Becksack and Stefan Schoenland, Rafael Fonseca, uh, Stadis Castridis. And I want to say a particular hello to one of our best trainees, Mohamed Ibrahim, who's now in Canada. Uh, this whole business about mentorship, you know, it's a two-way street. Um, if you don't learn from your mentees, then the opportunity is terribly missed. It's the only way to really keep current and uh, they stimulate you as much as you stimulate them. So I've never done my personal journey before, and these are my conflicts of interest, which won't have any impact on talking about myself. I'm going to talk about the challenges about setting up an amyloidosis multidisciplinary program, and then talk a little bit about my journey of uh, caring for these patients and early recognition. Then we can chat for the remaining time. Most patients are surprised to realize that amyloid has been described for well over 150 years. And it was described by two of the great pathologists known as prosectors, uh, Rudolf Virchow, who was the prosector of Berlin, and Karl Rokotansky, who was the prosector in Vienna. And they had a bitter, bitter rivalry, and they were insulting themselves in the literature repeatedly. Uh, Virchow, when he resected amyloid, he uh, found that it stained blue uh, when he exposed it to vital dyes. And with that blue exposure, those of you in high school who cut a potato in half and stained it blue to show its starchy consistency, Virchow said, oh, this must be starch. So it's it's like amylose, like amylin, like starch. So we'll call it amyloid. But Karl Rokotansky in Vienna, when he cut open a heart, he would see white glistening material. And he said, ah, this isn't starch at all. This is lardaceous. Uh, when he published that, Virchow wrote and said that Rokotansky was a better connoisseur of ham than he was of pathology. Uh, and this went on for over 20 years. And of course, neither one of them was right because the amyloid isn't lard, fat, and it isn't starch either. Now, of course, at the time, in 1850 to 1865, almost all the amyloid being seen was due to tuberculosis, leprosy, and untreated bronchiectasis, osteomyelitis, common problems that had no treatment, as well as chronic spondylarthropathies and chronic inflammatory problems such as ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, Stills disease, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and malaria. That was the bulk of the amyloid, and it all got mixed in, but there were some patients where you just couldn't figure out what was the cause? And so that was referred to as idiopathic or primary terms that shouldn't be used anymore. But that's what was taught. And it was recognized that there were very, very small populations where the amyloidosis itself was inherited. But that's what we came with into the 60s it was primary, secondary, and familial without really knowing much of anything else. Alan Cohn, who founded the Amyloidosis Center in Boston University, got a hold at Mass General, where he was, in 1959 and was able to look at amyloid. And he looked at it with the brand new electron microscope. And he said, my God, these are fibrils. And all of a sudden, a new vista was opened in that the amyloid, which still wasn't even known what it was exactly, you'll notice in the abstract it says it's predominantly protein, but not collagen or gamma globulin. It was not gamma globulin because Alan Cohn was a rheumatologist and all he saw, unbeknownst to him, was AA amyloid. If you are a hematologist or an oncologist, you're seeing, of course, AL amyloid where it is made up of gamma globulin. But he reported that fibrils were responsible as the ultrastructure, linear, non-branching, constant 
width of nine and a half nanometers. When Bob Kyle started working at Mayo, they had just developed the paper electrophoresis, uh, electrophoresis, which was developed in Sweden for which the Nobel Prize was awarded, uh, finally made it into the laboratory about 15 years later. And what Kyle did with his mentor, Ned Baird, Ned first described the sternal bone marrow in multiple myeloma, because the bone marrow prior to 1945 was really an autopsy test. And he looked at the electrophoresis of 165 patients and with myeloma and pretty typically found a monoclonal protein, which he defined monoclonal protein was height divided by width greater than four, which took care of the polyclonal wide. And then 77 non-myeloma patients, but the non-myeloma patients had lymphoma, macroglobulinemia, and amyloidosis. So this is one of the earliest recognitions that amyloidosis was associated with M proteins. But the patients that Bob Kyle and Ned Baird were seeing were totally different from the patients Alan Cohen was seeing, none of whom had monoclonal proteins. So Bob went on to look a year later, this is 1961, he started on staff in 1960, looking at these primary amyloid cases and looked at them and realized that there was an extremely, extremely strong association between the presence of a monoclonal protein and primary systemic amyloidosis, usually diagnosed at autopsy. The majority of these patients uh, were not diagnosed pre-mortem. They were known to have a monoclonal protein, but techniques for simple biopsy, this predates fat aspirate, predates the rectal biopsy, predates Congo red staining of the bone marrow, which could be done in the sternum, but not a biopsy could be done, and recognized that amyloid, myeloma, and monoclonal proteins had something to do with each other. Meanwhile, in... Seattle, Washington, Earl Bendit actually was successful in extracting amyloid. The ability to purify amyloid out of tissues was not well described. That actually happened in the laboratory of Ed Franklin. And what you did in those days is you homogenized amyloid-laden tissue with saline. And when you did that, you threw out the supernatant because everything that was soluble ended up in the supernatant, you tossed it. And the tissue pellet at the bottom of the tube was the amyloid because it's the one thing that wasn't soluble to anything. You couldn't denature it, you couldn't destroy it. So it just stayed in the bottom of the tube after you centrifuged. And then when you would suspend it in saline, you would get a suspension that was pure with amyloid. So it could really be studied. And so Earl Bendit actually extracted the protein and sequenced it. So the protein sequencing was just making its first trip into the clinical arena. And he synthesized the protein. It was the first synthesized protein. And so he called it amyloid A. This is the description of Mordechai Pross, who worked in the laboratory of Ed Franklin, who was a brilliant immunologist, uh, he did cryoglobulinemia, he did amyloid, but his life was cut short with a, uh, he developed a brain tumor uh, in his early 50s. But it was in his lab that Mordechai, who was spending a year in Ed's lab from Israel, realized that if you kept homogenizing it in saline, the amyloid would always be the pellet at the bottom, and then eventually you could purify it, and then you could study it. Then it, George Glenner actually did one of the second publications where he sequenced an amyloid fibril and proved that the amyloid fibril was a kappa immunoglobulin light chain, but not the whole light chain. It was a fragment of the light chain, it was the proximal variable region of a kappa-1 light chain. And so this really made it pretty clear that 
amyloid fibrils were two types, amyloid A, as described by Earl Bendit, as well as kappa immunoglobulin light chains. Now, it's a, a sad situation. Glenner was a real leader in this field. He was amazing. His life was cut short because in around 1990, he died of senile cardiac amyloidosis, uh, which, of course, today is known as wild-type TTR cardiac amyloid. So the irony of an amyloid pioneer succumbing to uh, amyloidosis of the heart, uh, it, it isn't lost. So then it began to accelerate. And so again, in a lab here, here this is now in the early 70s, a non-immunoglobulin component of amyloid fibrils was sequenced. This reconfirmed Earl Bendit's finding five years earlier of amyloid A. And those are the two sequenced proteins in the early 70s. In 1974, Elliot Osserman, who was a brilliant hematologist at Columbia University, working with Takashi Isobi, who also spent a year in his lab, in 1974, published in the New England Journal of Medicine that 46% of patients with amyloid had Benz Jones protein only. Remember, we don't have the immunoglobulin free light chain. Most laboratories at this point in time don't have immunofixation. This is, we don't have a cellulose acetate electrophoresis. This is still paper electrophoresis. And so the ability to do the analysis is really relatively limited, yet he was able to find Benz Jones proteins in the absence of a heavy chain in 46% compared to 21% of light chain myeloma. So this was kind of a big deal when he first presented this in terms of a really solid connection between Benz Jones proteins, immunoglobulin light chains, and light chain amyloid. So this is kind of a, this isn't going to be highly motivating because my pathway to medical school is hardly a straight line. So Isobi published that in 1974, and I uh, graduated from college in 1972. And originally, my plan was to um, go into uh, chemistry. I was going to be a chemist. And it turned out that majoring in chemistry, all the people in your medical school class are pre-med. Everybody's pre-med. And there's you have a class of 100. You've got 80 pre-meds and maybe three chemistry majors in a chemistry class. And so I was envisioning my career in chemistry, but it was laboratory-based. And uh, that meant I probably wouldn't talk to a lot of people. And those of you who know me know that a career where I'm not talking a lot and talking to many people, it, it's not a very good end point for me. And so one day after class, I saw one of my colleagues, a junior uh, at Northwestern, filling out some forms. And I said, what are you filling out? And he said, oh, I'm filling out the MCAT. I said, oh, what's that? He said, well, it's the medical college admissions test. I said, oh, what is that like? He said, oh, it's like taking the college entrance exams. It's kind of a multiple choice thing. I said, how much does it cost? He said, it's $5. I said, okay, $5 doesn't sound like a lot of money, and I've got nothing to lose. I'm going to be a chemist anyway, but I'll take the MCAT. Did okay. And I did some interviews for medical school. Um, it was a bit problematic, though, because People asked, well, are you interested in medicine? And I said, sure, I'm interested in medicine. And they'd say, well, how come you didn't take any biology classes in college? Well, that was a hard question to answer, but I still got in anyway. And so I got into medical school. And then I decided I liked the intellectual challenge of internal medicine. So I said, okay, I'll go into internal medicine, just like that. But the way internal medicine was structured was a bit of a problem because the way I did it is the first year you rotated on all general medical services. 
And in your first year, you were assigned for two months to a medical subspecialty in your first year. Well, I was assigned to hematology. I got eight weeks of hematology as a first year resident. Of those eight weeks, you had to take three weeks vacation. So I really only had five weeks of hematology. But I thought hematology was pretty cool. We were treated a lot of people with leukemia. Uh, it was an interesting time since we used a lot of doxorubicin. It was an investigational drug. Donorubicin didn't exist. The right atrial catheter didn't exist. Uh, ondansetron didn't exist. So nausea and vomiting was a big deal. Platelet transfusions were just coming on board to uh, manage these patients. We did leukemic induction with a peripheral IV because cytarabine did exist. And I said, this hematology is pretty interesting stuff. And you had to apply for fellowships in the first quarter of your second year. So I said, okay, I'll apply to hematology. I got into a bunch of different places. But at that point, I had just gotten married in my G1 year. And uh, I asked my wife, well, where do you want to go? I didn't apply in Chicago. I didn't want to stay in Chicago. And she said, oh, I'd like to stay the closest I possibly can. So I really don't want to go all the way to Boston or San Francisco. Can we go to Rochester? I said, sure, we can go to Rochester. Because at the end of the day, I'll spend three years in Rochester. Then I'll go back to Chicago, get myself a nice lucrative practice on Michigan Avenue, big car, lake cabin. So I can spend three years in Rochester. It won't kill me. Well, it turned out that my time at Mayo Clinic was pretty rewarding. I, I really actually enjoyed it at Mayo. I was having a very good time. And about 18 months into my three-year hematology oncology training, one night when Kyle finished work, and he never finished before 7 p.m., never. He never was done before 7, and he was in by 7 a.m. He calls me into his office, and he says, well, we're thinking about inviting you on to the staff of the Mayo Clinic. Now, at this time at the Mayo Clinic, if you were in hematology practice, you probably saw 20% hematology and 80% general medicine. So I have to tell you, I became quite good in the management of fibromyalgia and postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. I'm very, very good at that um, because we would attract those types of patients. And he calls me into his office. And he says, we think we'd like you to come on staff, but you know, we think it would be better for you if you did some subspecialization and not just do hematology general. I said, well, okay, I'm a pretty easygoing guy. And he says, well, what are you interested in? He said, well, I'll tell you, I'm really, really interested in chronic myelogenous leukemia. I think it's a fascinating field. This is before TKIs. And everybody succumbed to the disease within 18 months of diagnosis. And we had all the scores based on splenomegaly and myelocyte count. And he said, well, that's kind of good. He said, uh, but we don't see much chronic myelogenous leukemia over here. And I've got a pretty established practice in amyloidosis. And this is about 1981, 1980. Well, what about amyloidosis? I said, well, okay, that's, that sounds as good as anything. Uh, amyloidosis it is. And he said, well, you're not going to learn much more about amyloidosis here. Well, why don't you go study over in Boston? Boston University has a amyloid center. You get to live in Boston for a year. Kyle said, I worked with William Damashek in Boston for a year. It was good for my career. And I said, well, okay, that sounds good. Um, so I came home, discussed it with my wife. She was terribly disappointed that we weren't going back to Chicago and that we'd end up in Rochester. Those of you who've been here might understand a little bit of that. But I went out to do amyloid work with Dr. Cohn and Dr. Skinner. This is well, well before Dr. Comenzo, Dr. Selden, and Dr. Sancho Rawala were there. I was there and gone uh, when I came to study amyloid. 
The first patient I saw with amyloid, I remember extremely, extremely well. I was a second year medical resident and it was a gentleman in his 50s of Hispanic origin who was a um, undocumented alien in Chicago who presented with neuropathy and nephrotic syndrome and weight loss. And I was a pretty good resident, pretty hotshot kind of guy, you know, show off. And I kind of admitted him and worked him up. And then the attending came in the next day and he said, well, what do you think it is? I said, well, a gentleman of Hispanic origin with neuropathy, nephrotic syndrome and weight loss, this is almost certainly leprosy. And he said, leprosy, huh? Okay, well, in those days, in those days, a lot of these unclear diagnoses, because this predates CT imaging. We had CT head scans, but we didn't have CT body scans, didn't exist. So this patient went to an exploratory laparotomy and had an open kidney biopsy, which demonstrated amyloid. Well, I had no idea what that was in my residency. I mean, I had to read about it. It turns out it had something to do with monoclonal proteins, but uh, I, I don't remember even having it in medical school or I didn't attend that day. I'm not sure, but it's just kind of useful in terms of talking about the diagnostic journey that the first patient I saw, I missed by a mile and that he had it, but I certainly didn't recognize it. Well, the going at that point in time was that patients with amyloid inevitably died. They just were diagnosed and they didn't survive. And I saw this patient, this is 1986, and this was Kyle's patient actually, because I was just new on the job. And he treated this patient with melphalan and prednisone and this patient with a massive liver, it, it just, it just, he took melphalan and prednisone, his liver just normalized. And I was shocked because I just couldn't believe that patients with amyloid actually could be treated with anything at all. And so melphalan and prednisone was kind of an important thing, but uh, wasn't impressed that it was consistently effective. So I went back and looked at all the patients we had seen with amyloid, and this would be 1990 that I looked at it, and so 32 years ago. And I looked at every patient that we had treated with melphalan and prednisone, and lo and behold, 18% of the patients actually responded to melphalan and prednisone. And I thought that was super interesting because, A, it was a year to get a response, so they had to live a year to get there. But if you did get a response, you actually lived seven, eight years. But it was really weird because seven of the patients actually developed acute leukemia or dysmylopoietic syndrome. And considering how many patients lived to develop the problem, the actuarial risk of leukemia was almost 20%. That was really shocking to me. At the time, the standard of care was to give melphalan and prednisone for 36 months of therapy. That was the standard of care. Um, and it was understood at that time that alkylating agents could cause problems with MDS, although the metaphase genetics of minus five, minus seven weren't fully described at that time, but it was clear that patients could respond, but there was a high risk of developing late complications. Well, right around that time, I ran into some weird patients. So this, as you can see, is 1987. And at that time, technetium pyrophosphate was the standard treatment, the standard, excuse me, diagnostic test for metastatic cancer. At that time, we referred to a technetium pyrophosphate scan as a bone scan, a radionuclide bone scan. And all women with breast cancer and all men with prostate cancer ended up having bone scans done. And on a couple of the patients with prostate cancer, 
these patients ended up having intense uptake in the myocardium. We didn't have spec scans at that time. So this is just a 2D image where we found patients with prostate cancer and autopsy or biopsy findings of amyloid happened to have that increased uptake, but it seemed to be limited to the prostate cancer patients, meaning elderly and male, where the patients with what we referred to as myeloma-associated amyloid or AL amyloid never had that uptake. So we didn't quite get the whole picture, but it was clear that there were some patients with cardiac amyloidosis who had pyrophosphate uptake, 1987, and patients, mostly the ones who had multiple myeloma or plasma cell disease, didn't have uptake and patients without amyloid heart disease as controls didn't have uptake. You, you kind of have a general idea of where pyrophosphate scanning went over the last 35 years. But once I had seen that these patients could have myocardial uptake, we decided to look, Lyle Olson was a medical student, male medical student who's still at Mayo. This is a year later, and at the time, senile cardiac amyloid was thought to be an incidental autopsy finding that had no clinical relevance. But when we looked, we actually found four patients who had senile cardiac amyloid, but also had congestive heart failure, all of whom were men age 57 to 72, most of these are diagnosed at autopsy. Endomyocardial biopsy was not being used very much in 1987. And all of a sudden, it became clear that patients with senile cardiac amyloid actually could have cardiac failure. And that when you had cardiac amyloid, it wasn't just necessarily the myeloma M protein AL type, but patients could have senile cardiac amyloid with no monoclonal immunoglobulin and still have heart failure. So that really expanded our dimension on trying to understand cardiac amyloidosis and the fact that there were different types. It was at this time that Alan Solomon, who uh, was a pathologist who worked, he was a hematologist who worked with Ed Franklin, eventually went to Knoxville, Tennessee, where he took immunoglobulin light chains. He purified Benz Jones proteins. What he did is he purified Benz Jones proteins from myeloma patients, and he purified Benz Jones proteins from the urine in amyloid patients. And what he did is he injected them into mice. And when he injected Benz Jones proteins into mice from myeloma patient, nothing happened, nothing. But when he took the light chains from amyloid patients and injected it into the mice, they developed deposits in their kidney. And all of a sudden, it became clear that, wait a minute, there's something special about the light chains. It isn't just light chains, but there must be something very special about the light chains and AL amyloid that actually will produce amyloid deposits in mice. And what it was that was unique about them that made them amyloidogenic unclear, but it was very clear that it was the protein that caused the amyloid. So it was at this time that trying to capitalize on our knowledge of the use of melphalan and prednisone for the treatment of amyloid, that a comparative trial was done. There are so many rheumatologists in the 70s and 80s that were seeing patients with amyloid because of the lack of disease-modifying drugs, they were seeing all kinds of patients, and they were treating these patients with colchicine and patients who had AA amyloid from familial Mediterranean fever were also being treated for amyloid. They swore that colchicine was a highly effective agent. It was There were hundreds of articles in the literature on the use of colchicine for amyloid, and so with Dr. Kyle, a randomized phase three trial. This is the first phase three trial for AL amyloid. Colchicine versus melphalan and prednisone and melphalan and prednisone colchicine was done. 
showing a survival advantage for melphalan prednisone containing regimens and significant inferiority. So I guess the bottom line here is that phase three trials in AL amyloidosis were doable. It took us eight years to actually accrue all the patients for this trial that was published in 1997. So that's 43 years ago. There was a second trial that was published that looked at melphalan prednisone compared to a very popular myeloma regimen, VBMCP. This was the M2 regimen at Memorial Hospital in New York, vincristine, carmustine, melphalan, cyclophosphamide, and prednisone. We tried it, but again, we're able to do a phase three trial in amyloid, which was completely negative that nothing we had at the time was better than melphalan and prednisone. In the year 1985, we didn't have a stem cell transplant program. That was problematic. We had a allogeneic program, but we didn't have an autologous stem cell transplant program, even though we had an unbelievable blood bank, great nephrologists, great infectious disease specialists, but we really didn't have anybody that did myeloma let alone amyloid transplantation. So I had the opportunity to go down to Little Rock, Arkansas, which was the global epicenter of multiple myeloma transplantation and learned from Sundar Jagannath, who really was my primary mentor, and of course, Bart Barlogi. And we developed a myeloma program for transplant autologous at Mayo, but certainly after that, we started doing stem cell transplants about 1995. And when we tried to do that, we had a couple things. Number one, of course, at this time, the treatment for amyloid was still melphalan prednisone. The treatment for myeloma was vincristine doxorubicin dexamethasone followed by stem cell transplant. And when we started to transplant patients, we realized that this is a very different bird. As Dr. Castritis indicated, we saw deaths from GI bleeding, gut perforation, cardiac and renal failure, all the things that we needed to learn about, low serum albumin, high proteinuria, elevated creatinine, and not transplanting patients with advanced cardiac involvement or systolic blood pressure under 100. A very, very painful lesson. Um, but at least began to understand, and we began to then amongst ourselves start to modulate how are we going to improve the safety profile of stem cell transplantation? Well, we started to improve things. And so we did our first report and we had a better survival and we started to see organ responses with the exception of patients who had echocardiographic thicknesses greater than 15 millimeters. At this point, no troponin, no NT pro BNP. We had echo, but it was 2D echo, no diastolic functional studies, no relaxation time, no global longitudinal strain, as we're beginning to try and refine our ability to correctly uh, determine which of the patients are appropriate candidates for transplant. And at, at this point in time, we still hadn't been smart enough to start incorporating a large cohort of nephrologists, infectious disease doctors, and cardiologists. This is still yet to come as we build the amyloid program. Ray Comenzo and I shared our data to try and define which of the patients would be appropriate for stem cell transplant and came up with the risk adapted approach based on organ number and organ function, which stood almost 10 years in terms of the defining criteria for stem cell transplant. But then there was a big breakthrough in 2003. The binding site developed a polyclonal assay using goat antibodies to analyze serum-free light chains. And once we had serum-free light chains, everything changed. 
because our ability to assess response and even diagnose AL amyloidosis was turned on its head. It's about this time that we started the multidisciplinary recruitment into the division of hematology. Nelson Learn was the first. He's a nephrologist. Those of you who know him know that he defined monoclonal gammopathy of renal significance. And we brought him into the division of hematology. He was trained to administer chemotherapy and then started to join our weekly dysproteinemia meetings to help us understand what we were doing with the kidney and what the supportive care guidelines. About a year after that, Michelle Mauerman joined in neurology so we could understand what was the deal with MGUS neuropathy and how that differed from AL neuropathy and managing autonomic failure and amyloidosis. Then Martha Grogan partnered up with Angela Dispensieri in cardiology and became a leader in the diagnosis assessment of both TTR and AL amyloid. And Matthew Drake joined in endocrinology because we had so much problem with managing myeloma bone disease and fractures and who gets vertebroplasty and what's the best bisphosphonate and how we manage those. And that really is the key to having an effective amyloid clinic. Hematologists just don't have the expertise to do this by themselves. And sending someone for a consult for someone who's not interested in amyloid is not going to get you anywhere. You need to have people join your official group, attend the meetings, and start to help develop guidelines about what do we do about kidney amyloid, nerve amyloid, heart amyloid, and the endocrinologist is primarily for myeloma, but still patients with monoclonal gammopathies have high incidences. And so in terms of the structure, this becomes a very, very big deal about having 10 hematologists who are interested doesn't get you where you need to be. You need to pick out people who are career ambitious, the people who want to establish themselves. And once you have a multidisciplinary group, then you can figure out your treatment protocols, how to manage bortezomib toxicity with the neurologist, who actually is a candidate for a heart transplant, a kidney transplant, who needs a sural nerve biopsy. That can't be done by a bunch of hematologists sitting in a room talking to each other. You need to have these people recruited and they have to become actually jointly appointed in your division. That's very important, in my opinion, to get that name recognition that Nelson learned hematology and nephrology, Mauerman, neurology and hematology, Grogan, cardiology and hematology. Those are very important. And so we were able to figure out with the specialists how to manage the melphalandose before stem cell transplant. But we found out that what it was associated with a lower response rate at MEL140. And that was probably still okay because 2004, we had thalidomide. It was the first year of bortezomib and maybe the second year of lenalidomide. So it was still primarily melphalan and prednisone. So even a lower response rate was better than what we had. We had a meeting in 2005 because as we're developing these studies, we have to figure out, okay, we have studies, but we have to all agree on what constitutes a response, both an organ response as well as a hematologic response. And so the first definition of response criteria was developed at the 10th International Symposium in Amyloidosis. We're now on the 18th. We found out that patients who got growth factor post-transplant had terrible problems with fluid retention. They had terrible problems with weight gain and dyspnea and pulmonary edema. So 15 years ago, we discontinued the use of growth factor after day zero. We'd use it for stem cell collection, but we quit doing it after we realized that we could get these patients safely engrafted with no growth factor support. So no growth factor for amyloid. And we'd already been doing no growth factor for myeloma for a couple of years. You'll notice that Nelson Learn is now a co-author of articles. He helped us refine our patient selection, and it turned out that we started to reduce our day 100 all-cause mortality 
from 10.5% to 4%, it's now 2.5%. And again, now we've got in, included Nelson as part of our critical decision makers, as well as some of the allo transplanters. We summarized this, and you can see that Mohammed Aljama is a co-author here. Uh, I don't think he's on the call. And Hasib Siddiqui, who's now in Australia, looking at how the use of transplant, you can refine it, and you can get the therapy-related mortality in appropriately selected patients down to 2%. Higher than that, you don't want to do a transplant. We have too many good therapies now. Um, We've already heard about Andromeda and Venetoclax and pomalidomide, which are so effective that now our use of transplant has declined quite substantially because we will not put patients on protocol unless we're convinced it's completely survivable. We wrote a letter to the editor, To Blood. Uh, this would be six years ago now, where we actually saw two patients with really advanced amyloid, and we gave them daratumumab, and all of a sudden we saw amazing responses. That's just a graph. You can see how the patient had failed, cyclophosphamide, carfilzomib, and uh, responded beautifully to daratumumab. And so we wrote that up as a letter and hopefully kicked off the daratumumab generation. Finally, Ali Mukhtar, who's now on our staff, looked at all of our patients, uh, not just at organ response, but depth of organ response. For hematologic response, we have CR, VG, PR, PR, and no response. But with organ response, all we really had at that time was you responded or you didn't respond, and we realized that wasn't good. We needed to get depth of response. And so now we have defined cardiac and renal complete, very good partial, partial and no response for organ criteria. We published this in the cardiac in Journal of Clinical Oncology about six weeks ago. Also, we looked pretty hard at MRD because we didn't have that originally. And now we realize that patients with amyloidosis who achieve a CR can even do better. They can do stringent CR and like myeloma, they can do MRD. And although this isn't a decision-making technique, it is prognostic. This will tell you which patients are destined to do the best. That is different from saying we're recommending that patients go to MRD and be treated to MRD. But if they happen to achieve MRD, their outcomes are much, much better. And so it's been a wonderful journey from the primitive techniques to what we've developed onto that time, there's no way it works without the people doing the light chains for you, the pathologists who are doing the mass spec and telling you the specific typing, the nuclear medicine doctors doing the imaging, the echocardiographers, the clinicians, the cardiologists, nephrologists, and neurologists. Otherwise, it's a no-go. It takes 15 to 20 people to really establish an amyloidosis program. And I'm just honored to have been a part of it. And I thank you very much for giving me the time to talk a little bit about how things worked out for me. No, thank, thank you so much, Molly. We, um, we have uh, here a fantastic journey from you. 
um, and for uh, closing our uh, closing our amyloid day. So, yeah. So uh, that that kind of wraps up our our program for today. So I want to uh, again thank um, the the people who helped us organize this. Um, Jeannie, uh, Sheldon, and uh, Jan uh, Bean Husen and Shireen Kassab and the team at Libin, uh, who did a tremendous amount of work to prepare for today. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors as well, uh, Axia, Al Nylum, Janssen, Prothena, Pfizer, uh, Binding Site, uh, and the Libin Cardiovascular Institute for the support they've given us to uh, help make today possible. And uh, thank you again to all our speakers and especially to everyone in our audience for, for joining us today. It's been a, a tremendous day and we've, we really had a, a great list of speakers and conversations. Uh, and to my co-chair, uh, co Victor, Dr. Zapata uh, as well. So um, I hope uh, I hope you have a, a really nice week uh, and evening. And uh, another reminder that uh, it's World Amyloidosis Day uh, next week. Please also fill out your evaluations uh, for our program. We really value your feedback, um, and we uh, we hope to do our, our fifth uh, event uh, next year around this time. Uh, so thanks very much again for, for joining us.